Thank you also for the invitation. Uh, Sally Sattel, I'm a psychiatrist. I've done some work at the West Haven VA for five years, in 88 to 90, 92, and um, also worked with Tom Harvey on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, and now I'm a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, lastly, on our opening statements is uh, Dr. Uh, Sally Sattel with the uh, American Enterprise Institute. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk a little more, more broadly based on my experience that I mentioned before um, from it was 1988 to 1993 when I was, um, an, I was assistant professor at Yale School of Medicine based out at the West Haven VA, which was a teaching hospital. Now, even though that experience was so many years ago, I think it offers valuable lessons for today's veterans, and I'm going to talk about three of them. The first lesson is to be optimistic about prospects for recovery from PTSD. At West Haven, we weren't very optimistic, but that was sort of the state-of-the-art thinking in the 70s, 80s, and maybe even early 90s <clears throat> about, about veterans and about PTSD in general. The understanding was that PTSD is invariably chronic and that patients were irretrievably shattered from their experience. That is not true. Uh, Dr. Rosenberg mentioned that the uh, default position, in fact, is resilience. Uh, people typically recover, and Mr. Milia suggested that all the folks on Wall Street and leading productive lives, which is not to say that occasional painful memories, these kinds of things. But yeah, yeah. again, the, I, the... Oh, should I continue? Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know if, what was going on here. Okay. Um, uh, anyway, the default position again is, is to recover. Uh, and there are excellent treatments for the component parts of the diagnosis of PTSD. And I emphasize component parts because that's how we treat in psychiatry, largely. We treat actually by symptoms. Uh, we treat, we have a lot of diagnoses, uh, but PTSD in particular is something we treat not by diagnosis. There's no single treatment for PTSD. There are treatments for the elements of post-traumatic stress disorder. So for example, if a person has intense phobias, you know, someone who's driving around Iraq now, it's very, I could imagine how hard, and I've heard reports of this, how difficult it is to drive in traffic. Uh, something like that's a phobia that's highly treatable with desensitization protocols and exposure. This is behavior therapy 101, very, very effective. Uh, when we have patients with depression or sleep problems, we can treat that. We have medication. We have cognitive behavioral therapy. Same for anxiety. Uh, a lot of folks will have existential uh, difficulties. I mean, the readjustment is tremendous. They've spent time a world away and experienced things that most of us never have. And that's a kind of readjustment, too, that psychotherapy can help with. But all these component parts, there are excellent, excellent therapies for them. Uh, my second point, in addition to being optimistic that the prospects of re for recovery are very good, uh, is that we should very much emphasize a rehabilitation approach. Again, when I was at West Haven, we were, we were all very well-meaning, but in retrospect, I think we did a lot that wasn't very helpful. And this was Vietnam veterans, of course, I'm talking about. We spent an inordinate amount of time urging veterans to relive their war experiences over and over and over in group therapy and in individual therapy and art therapy. Uh, we would admit groups of veterans to the hospital and a cohort, and they'd stay together for months. They'd practically recreate a platoon, a practice that took them out of their communities, away from their families. I remember we since some of the patients would go out on a weekend on a pass and they'd come back with war tattoos and they'd come back wearing combat fatigues. This is not how you approach readjustment. In retrospect, we should have put a great deal more emphasis on the resolution of everyday problems in living. And that is a key lesson for today as well. The focus on reintegration. Returning veterans have enormous burdens. Uh, marital discord, which can be huge, and again, how, how could it not be coming back to your family after so long? Again, living almost a parallel existence for so long. Uh, your children, the readjustment to civilian life, reentry into the workplace, uh, new skills, a new profession. 
But when life can be made more manageable, even if a person is symptomatic, he can feel much more in control of his future and can tolerate some of these symptoms better, the sleep problems, the distressing memories. And also, these symptoms will fade much faster when someone sees their life coming together. Because otherwise, he will be very, and she, will be very demoralized. Demoralization is not a formal psychiatric diagnosis. But in my experience, it's the difference between someone who throws in the towel and someone who prevails. The final lesson is to be very cautious about granting 100% disability benefits, permanent and total disability. A few weeks ago, I was asked to comment on a story of a 22-year-old veteran who was having trouble getting 100% service connection for PTSD. This was right on the heels of the uh, Walter Reed problem. Uh, this was a story on NPR, and this young man got a lawyer to help him uh, fight with the VA about this disability. And I was asked to comment on the advisability of disability payments for this gentleman. My first thought was, uh, wait a minute, uh, permanent and total disability at age 22 could be the worst thing for this young man. Because first, we don't even know if he'll be a chronic case. He'd been back three months. On top of that, he hadn't even treated at all. So to the idea of, of condemning someone to, a, to a, a life of total and permanent disability, or I should say a label of that, before he'd even been treated is, is bizarre and, and just clinically um, not a good idea. Uh, this young man undoubtedly felt very scared and hopeless. He probably did see himself as destined for a life as a psychiatric invalid. So then what's the job of psychiatrists when you have a patient like that before you? It's to show him that he's wrong, not to confirm his pessimism and tell him that there is no hope, which is what you do when you grant total and permanent disability status. As someone mentioned early care, that is so important. This is the time when vulnerable patients are most responsive. You change the trajectory, you turn them into a recovery a recovered person, not someone destined for a life of chronic dysfunction and disability. Um, thank you. By sitting home, I, I should, let me just say now, the VA is very generous with its disability payments, and it should be. And for that minority of, of, of uh, returning veterans who are not going to recover, thank goodness it's there, and I want them to have it. But we have to have a very high threshold, I believe, for uh, giving this kind of entitlement out. By sitting home on disability, for example, the patient will typically, as we've seen so much of this with the Vietnam veterans, adopt a sick role that then deprives him of one of the best therapies we know of, which happens to be work itself. When you don't work, you lose a sense of purpose that work endows, or at the very least, a distraction from depressive ruminations. It's a daily structure that is so important. It's the opportunity for socializing. All these things are critical to a person's reintegration and recovery and self-image and self-worth. To me, it is nothing short of malpractice to have someone prematurely considered disabled. Uh, so, Dr. Sattel, I, I hate to interrupt you. Uh, we have uh, one vote. Was, I was just going to summarize. Okay, that that'd be great. Yeah. And we're going to recess for about 10 minutes, but go ahead, oh, please. Oh, all right. Well, in summary then, I suggest we think of post-traumatic stress disorder as a treatable and time-limited affliction. And this is key that we treat it early when symptoms are most responsive to therapeutic intervention, focus on practical issues and rehabilitation, and take advantage of the well-established finding that a prognosis after a trauma depends upon the way a person sees himself. And if his expectation is one of recovery, of resumption of his life, and that good treatment is available, and that these obstacles we talked about before with the family and the reintegration uh, can be helped, there are excellent odds that he will do well. And I think there's a lot the VA can do to make this happen. Thank you. Now, the reason I say that is because I'm just looking at your bio that seems to tell me, um, one, your most recent book, How Political Correctness is Corrupting Medicine, which might suggest that we're going to go down a political correctness road that every soldier coming back is damaged by this war and should be treated. Or the other one, um, 
uh, one, one nation under therapy. You're saying how the helping culture is eroding self-reliance, that my willingness to help these soldiers get diagnostically test may be enabling them to post-traumatic stress. So I'd like to give you the opportunity to okay. tell me why, why I may be mistaken in my brief analysis well, I here. I don't think you are uh, mistaken in what you said. You're mistaken in how you characterized my skepticism, because I actually agree with uh, Dr. Rosenberg completely. I think we should, the whole idea is up front, up front. That wasn't done with Vietnam. In fact, everything was done after the fact. Uh, even the research sometimes is hard to extrapolate from our Vietnam veteran research to this current group because they didn't start coming forward to the VA for over 10, 10 years. And uh, by then, you're dealing with an accumulation of so many problems, people who never regained their civilian footing and then just got further and further off track, and then the drugs, and then the unemployment, the domestic violence, and you had a, such a complicated amalgam of things to tease apart. That's why upfront is key, and I, I, I very much agree with him about the screening, and then you, you hone in on the people who are the red, you know, the red flags, and one hopes they'll be the minority. Um, and then when you have the red flag folks and you find out what's going on, and some truly will have real pathology, real clinical, then the approach there is all right, some fraction of you probably won't ever really regain your, your functioning, but, but that will be a small group. And with the rest of you, we're gonna to work to get you back. Uh, and in fact, I, I, uh, I'm not just theoretically or clinically, I'd like to see I'm, as much treatment as possible. It's the disability part where I get very worried um, because we could take people who are potentially rehabilitatable and then once you get that check, you know what it's, you know what it's like. If you are rehabilitatable, I emphasize that, and you get that check, then there's every incentive to not get better. And as I said before, the longer you don't work, the longer you don't work. Your skills atrophy, your confidence erodes, it's harder to go back to the workplace. And it, for folks who can't really work, thank goodness that money is there. But for the others, it's a, it's a horrible position to put them in. But, yeah, Mr. Chair. I'm sorry. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Uh, he had a question. I'm oh, sorry. He had a question before. Okay. Yeah. Go. Oh. Um, and you, you had asked about temporary disability. I know Social Security has that, and I've signed. Um, I work in a methadone clinic here, yeah. and I have signed for a few people for six months because that's about all my tolerance is for them. Because I know that once they get back, you know, once that period of insecurity is over, and they they can they can do pretty well. So I am partial to the idea of temporary. I would, I'd have to give this a lot more thought, but I'd almost rather have it be viewed as financial help than as a disability payment, because that already puts it in the culture of you're sick and we're giving you the money because you're sick. No, we're giving you the money because you're, on, you're having a hard time and, um, and you, will, you have a condition, all likelihood of which, in which you will recover, and this is part of the way in which you will recover. Those post-event um, dynamics we talked about, that, that kind of uh, confidence and efficacy. Dr. Satel. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I'll just sum up by saying that I'd like us you know, to relinquish uh, this presumption of fragility that uh, folks who experience, admittedly, enormously intense and prolonged and, and in some ways just, you know, unheard of in the, in the scope of our experience. Uh, but that, again, the, the, the likelihood that they will prevail and they will recover if they become ill is very high. Uh, when they do come back, if they want help, I'd like that to be as timely as possible, Gen if generous outsourcing is what's needed to make that possible with qualified clinicians. To view chronic dysfunction uh, as an outcome, as an exception, and to have a very high threshold for granting 100% total and permanent disability. What do you think of the, uh, the suggestion from uh, John about uh, even if you gave such a diagnosis, have it flexible, you know, that returning to work is not disincentivized, oh. but uh, uh, in fact encouraged? Oh, I agree with that. Yeah. Of course, I agree with that 100%. Uh, the flip side of it is that uh, for some folks, the disability is a perverse incentive to stay sick. It's just, it's the flip side. They're both, they both apply. And, uh, and that's, that's one of the reasons why, again, I think we should have such a high threshold, give it to people who need it and are not going to recover. Uh, but uh, be wary that, you know, uh, the longer someone gets a check and when they are rehabilitatable, 
then their motivation to work uh, begins to erode and, and their confidence in being in the workplace atrophies. And, uh, and then you've got a, a downhill, you know, a downward spiral. I haven't, I haven't seen any data of this, pop, this generation of veterans in terms of uh, treatment outcomes. Uh, there's a lot of uh, data, you may have mentioned it, but Charles Hogue and Walter Reed and others who've done a lot of screening, and that's why we do get these numbers of 30% coming back with, with symptoms of PTSD, which is very different than PTSD. In mm -hmm. fact, when he followed those patients, only a, a few of them had more than one uh, visit at the VA in the mental health uh, de department. Uh, these are folks with stress. Uh, stress is not a mental disorder. Uh, I do feel, though, in part, we shouldn't be so diagnosis-bound. If a person is distressed, I think we should help them. Um, and, uh, of course, the less the distress and the less they approach the clinical realm, and there's never a real sharp line in psychiatry, unfortunately, but uh, only, the, only the extremes are, are really identifiable. Um, yeah. But uh, you know, folks come in with stress, and we help them, and we get them on their way.